Well, welcome everybody to the webinar today. My name is John Stamatikos. I'm a member of the Committee for Geological and Geotechnical Engineering at the National Academy, and I'm the moderator of today's webinar. COGI, uh, as we call it, this committee uh, is a standing committee of the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine on the board uh, under the board of their Sciences and Resources. The committee was established as the focal point of the National Academy for Government Industry and Academia on Technical and Public Policy Issues Related to Earth Processes and Minerals, Materials, Soils, and Rock Mechanics, Responsible Human Development and Mitigation of Natural and Human Hazards. If you have any specific questions about COGI, well, you can contact uh, Samantha Magsino at the National Academy. She's our staff director of this, of this committee. This webinar is part of our quarterly webinar series produced by COGI through the support of the National Science Foundation. Uh, the webinar will be posted on YouTube, so you'll be able to follow up uh, today. It's being recorded, as you've heard, and so you'll be able to follow up um, and watch it on YouTube. Hit the like button when you do. If you open your chats, uh, you can message us and the speaker. Uh, we're hoping to have time at the end for questions and answers um, of the panelists. The process there, you can submit your questions anytime using the Q&A tab on your Zoom panel, and we will collect those and uh, I'll read those uh, targeting one of our panelists at the end, um, and hopefully we'll be able to get through as many questions as you submit as possible. I must say that as a disclaimer, any opinions, conclusions, or recommendations expressed by the panelists or anyone during this webinar are those of the individuals do not represent conclusions or recommendations of the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine. Sam Magsino and Emily Bermudez has uh, set up the webinar and Mandy Enriquez is producing it. So uh, let me now begin with introducing our two speakers. Um, the breath <clears throat> breakthroughs in augmented reality technologies can provide geoprofessionals new levels of access and in insights into field <laughs> Field sites, augmented reality technologies are accessible enough to allow geoprofessionals, decision makers, and students to visit field sites virtually and literally walk the sites, view them from above, below, or within, um, and superimpose data existing or planned infrastructure and models onto them. So today we have Ben Rivers, senior geotechnical engineer in the Office of Innovation Implementation at Federal Highway Administration and Keith Lay, who's Director of, of Contact at Cleary Technologies to discuss how augmented reality could transform the world for geoprofessionals. So we'll be, the bio, bios of both our speakers are gonna be posted um, in a moment in our, in our chat. Um, so uh, let me begin um, and I'll turn the, the, o, o, over to Ben and uh, ask him to give the first of our presentations. Very good, thank you, John. And I'm going to share my screen. Excellent. Very good. So uh, welcome, everybody. Um, thanks for joining. Uh, I am going to provide an overview presentation, leveling up your A-game and your superpowers. If you didn't know you had superpowers, you you do. And, and augmented reality uh, can, can enhance those superpowers. And as soon as I say uh, you have superpowers, I want to give you disclaimers. Uh, so I'm, uh, of course, with the government. And um, just letting you know anything that I present today here does has no force or effect of, of law, uh, so no superpowers by law. Um, and the U.S. government um, does not endorse uh, any specific products or manufacturers. We're talking about technologies uh, specifically here, augmented reality, extended reality, and a little bit on, on, on virtual reality is uh, sort of the... Uh, Extended reality is, is considered both of those, those two. So um, just uh, a little bit of background on where I'm headed today uh, in, in this presentation. Pretty much everything that I'm going to present is, is centered around the fact that we're headed uh, in the future, not too far in digital delivery uh, and in, in needing uh, digital workflows to do that and, and augmented reality really plays a part in, in both of those realms and enhancing um, our understanding and uh, that workflow process. It, we also have the opportunity to 
to um, use augmented reality in, in improving our learning experiences too, which I'll uh, provide uh, several examples or one example on, on uh, the learning aspect, but several examples and how we can apply it into uh, geotechnical engineering practice. So very fundamentally, I think uh, where this extended reality, both virtual and, and augmented reality um, uh, plays a part is, is in enhancing or uh, making more effective our decisions in, in planning analysis uh, engineering and construction using or in, enhancing these five C's. Uh, collaboration, if we're um, with technical people or with non-technical people, both um, this uh, has the ability of, of providing enhanced comprehension immediately uh, with uh, the, the visual aspects in, in, as, as you'll see here. But um, I think sort of at the very center of uh, what extended reality provides is, is a communication tool and also this added comprehension. Coordination can also happen as well. I think we can use this uh, effectively in pre-construction meetings, pre-bid meetings uh, as, as well. So uh, first example I wanted to share with you uh, and by the way, just as as we're presenting here, I, I, I challenge you to to think of other applications and how we can use this in in our uh, geo profession, um, not just related to uh, pro, uh, digital delivery or, or workflow, um, but that's certainly where I'm I'm headed here, um, and in the um, educational component of this. So this is something that our hydraulic counterparts in the resource center developed <clears throat> recently using uh, virtual reality. Uh, and, and the difference between virtual reality and augmented reality, the big difference is that virtual reality um, uh, sort of cuts you off from the space that you're in and puts you into a virtual environment. And, and so it, it's completely immersive uh, within that environment. And people can come in as avatars within that environment as, as well. So there can be collaboration but uh, in this instance where our hydraulics folks, uh, they, they used it for um, enhanced learning. And this is the Elwha River uh, uh, Valley area. And, and uh, they, they used this as a, as a module within their training. And maybe there's you know, one other C involved within our five Cs, maybe a sixth C in context. And if you can see this, uh, map that orients you in what you're kind of looking at. Um, and I have, let me turn on my laser pointer here. Um, yeah, so you can see, um, you know, this this over uh, overview map provides some context of what you uh, would, you are seeing or where you're navigating to. Uh, in this case, you have a couple of sites that uh, are specific to learning objectives for, for this training. Um, and, you know, if you click one of those icons, it takes you to one of these dialog boxes where there's inf more information uh, that it could be multimedia, um, it could be photographs, uh, graphics, uh, videos, reference materials, uh, other uh, materials to, to to aid our understanding in this uh, complete immersive environment. But the other the aspect of, of learning, especially in adults, is uh, having the ability to interact. And so with this this environment that we're that the hydraulics uh, um, resource center folks have created, I think that that provides that immersive environment in, in a very interactive environment. And you can see, you know, here's a, um, so there's three-dimensional cameras that they use almost like a Google Street uh, View um, application. And once you're in that environment uh, that you can look around and I could see us using this for site reconnaissance or training that we want to sh bring people who have not experienced the field, um, you know, into the field uh, virtually. Uh, and we, we could actually, in, in an augmented reality, uh, have a, a very similar experience. The 
difference there is that we're not separated. And so if we have people within the room, we can also communicate uh, among uh, the, the people there uh, on the models that we're, we're seeing together. Um, but for uh, site reconnaissance, uh, looking at uh, geomorphology, um, landforms, uh, and, and painting a picture of what the site conditions are, uh, sort of walking, um, uh, you know, a, a learning module in how we would do a, a site investigation, site characterization. I think this would be a, a perfect opportunity to uh, to create a model. So I'm I'm very excited about uh, that prospect there. Uh, one other element that, or one other example that I want to show. I have one other after this one, but this is uh, Manning's crevice in Idaho. Um, so this is an application where um, I, I think you can see value with augmented reality. This is not a very complex problem from from the structural side, but from the geology side, it, it is complex. Um, so this is a um, bridge that was built in the 1930s that was going to be replaced uh, with an asymmetric bridge and beautiful structure. You see the, the uh, uh, previous bridge in, in the, the background, in the new bridge in the foreground, and you're seeing uh, some of the geology uh, and the structure of, of the rock here and there's a big ask uh, for the the loads uh, for this bridge, you know, right at this substructure here in the anchor, the housing uh, that you're seeing there. <clears throat> so not a very uh, complex bridge, beautiful bridge, uh, a lot of ask at those locations. And you can see again, the structure of the geology here uh, with this substructure and the, the housing of the, the anchors here. So you know, for the investigation, doing some mapping uh, was was done, uh, and and also confirming those conditions at those locations of the the foundation elements and and uh, anchors with uh, televiewer data that can provide orientation, uh, confirming uh, the conditions of the the joints, the structure uh, within that rock within uh, that. The uh, the mountainside there, where the the anchors will be um, uh, located, or or uh, providing resistance, and of course, uh, geologists know stereo nets. Some geotechnical engineers might know stereo nets, um, but the non technical uh, to non technical folk, this uh, doesn't have meaning. And trying to explain a stereo net quickly certainly is not this challenge. So. Obviously, there was uh, analysis involved in, in this project for, for the anchor systems, finite element analysis on, on how these uh, loads were being transferred and the, the uh, corresponding uh, displacements there. But we don't have to, like, the stereo nets that we're seeing in, in the complexity of this project, when you see it in an environment that's three-dimensional like this, uh, especially if, if you're immersed in this and, and you're able to walk around uh, this model, you can you can see it and immediately understand uh, the spatial uh, components of this project. And you can put the joint sets right in the model, too. So you don't have to understand stereo nets. You don't have to explain to somebody what a stereo net is. You can show the joint structure there and how that plays a part in the uh, the orientations of those anchors and, and uh, you know, why, um, you know, just what's at stake on, on the design. So the the idea of, of augmented reality or extended reality is, is really improving our comprehension of, of and, and communication abilities, uh, especially where we have those complex uh, conditions. And I'm just going to show you um, some um, uh, slides here running through. You're seeing uh, what you just saw there, but also uh, time-related data, uh, virtual cores, uh, information RQDs there, um, geophysical data overlapped, uh, seismic and uh, electrical resistivity, and different ways to actually show uh, the data and what, how things vary across a site is, is quite powerful. Uh, with with this uh, uh, the technology of 
augmented reality. Uh, one additional case history I wanted to share with you is the uh, US uh, 231 project, which is uh, courtesy of, of Alabama Department of Transportation. This is a project that uh, unfortunately occurred uh, in February of 2020, uh, shutting both lanes of, of travel down. And um, uh, yeah, so for essentially for seven months, this was a, a ER project. Uh, and obviously they were hustling. This is a major corridor. Uh, out of, of Huntsville uh, through Lacey Springs is where this was located, but they were able to get this back open uh, in seven months by constructing a bridge. And so the foundations of this bridge were very robust drilled shafts. Um, but as, as, uh, as, uh, so they, they wanted to, to um, exper uh, experiment with this technology of course, getting these models done during the the project delivery time was was it, uh, not going to happen. But afterwards, they were able to to show an application here of a dynamic digital twin, where obviously since they built this, this is an active landslide. They they have the ability with this digital model to track uh, the the uh, performance of these drilled shafts, and I'm not showing you. Um, the displacements here, uh, but there are accelerates, uh, uh, shape accelerates, uh, and bosometer data that, and you can see all of the um, data points that are, uh, you know, within this baseline model. And this is LIDAR uh, with change detection uh, turned on here that you can see where some movements have, have occurred, They're just very localized, and the, the ge geophysical data electrical resistivity uh, overlaid here too but uh, it's a very powerful tool even for those who are not technical to see um, what's moving uh, how conditions vary across the site uh, so a lot of application in this case for asset management essentially of a structure that uh, it was constructed on an active landslide and, and being monitored and so this digital Twin essentially is is uh, aiding the workflow of this this uh, performance management uh, asset management monitoring program where um, you know the, we have data that's coming in and it can be translated through something like DIGS uh, standardized uh, data transfer schema uh, for for data and providing that information in, into that digital twin where we can look and see what changes have occurred over time. Uh, one final case history that I wanted to share, this is courtesy, courtesy of Nick uh, McIris. Uh, he, he did a case study just showing um, that you could take uh, technology that, that's in our hands, our, our mobile phones, and capture core data. And uh, with available software that's that's uh, open source uh, provided by major technical companies, um, he was able to to uh, generate what you're seeing here. Um, and, and you know it, it's scalable as far as the amount of work that that's required to do something like this. So um, for for this simple example or case study that he did here, and I don't know many corsets he, he actually did, um, but it's it's uh, quite possible to do that and view that on a mobile, like, like you're seeing here, a mobile device uh, and being able to ma manipulate core. So just some other possible applications that you can probably think of uh, where we can use photogrammetry like we are seeing here. So uh, just sort of to wrap up here, you know, the, the fact that we, uh, a couple of takeaways, you know, we can leverage augmented reality to, to, to really uh, enhance our experience, especially in these complex uh, conditions or complex projects, um, and, and being able to show these models within three-dimensional uh, models or even four-dimensional models, uh, we, we can show stakeholders who are not necessarily technical even uh, how these things relate. But you can see just how powerful 
you know, if, if a picture is worth a thousand words, if you're looking at what you're seeing here uh, with multiple data um, shown on the same screen, overlapped geophysical data. Uh, so, you know, three dimensions plus these, these layers were in multiple dimensions uh, where, you know, or magnitudes away from that, uh, that thousand word picture now. Uh, eventually, uh, we're, we're getting things are moving toward BIM and three dimensional um, models that, that we're um, delivering uh, for our projects. And being able to convey that to all stakeholders, I think, is, is uh, pretty much a, an essential part. And augmented reality really plays a role uh, with that. Uh, so some applications, uh, fundamentally, uh, communication tool, um, rapid comprehension just by uh, able uh, being able to, to see uh, these, uh, um, these data within um, three-dimensional, four-dimensional spaces uh, collectively uh, is, is very powerful um, from public engagement, learning, uh, site characterization, where we're getting information from the field, bringing it in. If we, you know, if, if that model doesn't make sense, we know we need to go back out there and, and uh, uh, understand. So that was that final C on the confidence side, um, you know, we can use uh, these models to, to provide insight in, to our understanding of this. Eventually getting, or you saw the, the digital twin uh, example there, but where we want to eventually get, I think, is practice where we're headed is, uh, we're not there yet, but uh, model as a legal document. And I think the structures folks are closer than we are on the underground uh, but we we still need to figure out how we represent data, uh, you know, within these models uh, for for those applications. So with that, John, I will turn it back over to you. And thanks. That was fantastic. So I'm just going to then pass this on to Keith. So Keith um, um, has uh, some actual demonstrations for us, and I'm really looking forward to that. And I'm sure everybody else is. Don't forget to post your questions. Uh, in the quick Q&A and we'll get to those at the end of the talk. So Keith, it's all up to you now. Hey everyone, uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, my name is Keith Lay, uh, Director of Content from uh, Cleario uh, Inc. Uh, and so, yeah, I just wanted to uh, give up some demos actually using some of this technology and kind of show how this works. Uh, um, we work closely with uh, Ben's team and, and other teams at FHWA to kind of help create some of the visualizations that you saw in his presentation. And in terms of delivery, there's actually a couple of different ways that uh, this can uh, can be done. Um, you saw some of the, the slides uh, uh, of Ben's, <clears throat> people were wearing a headset. So this is um, an example of a headset. This is the, uh, the uh, HoloLens uh, from Microsoft. Uh, it's what we call a mixed reality headset. You'll notice that the, the lens is clear. Uh, and as Ben correctly pointed out, there is a difference between virtual reality, where you're actually wearing a headset that cuts you off from the world and you only see what the computer uh, shows you, uh, versus augmented, or in this case, mixed reality, where you're actually projecting the, uh, the 3D data into the room, uh, yet you can also continue to see the room uh, and see the other people around you. So just a couple of different ways to, to uh, implement that. Uh, but we don't even need necessarily to use headsets. We can also use things like our uh, our tablets and our phones to participate in this, which is a little bit more ubiquitous because uh, it's equipment that people might have on hand already. Um, but uh, just going to show a few examples of that here. I'm going to bring up, um, uh, I'm going to share my screen on, on my iPad, and I'm actually going to uh, uh, show some examples of this in, in action. So if you can uh, see my shared screen here, um, this is actually coming from the, uh, the iPad that I'm uh, holding in my hand here. And uh, this is actually the model that uh, been uh, referenced in Alabama. This is the uh, US-231 uh, project. And so what we're seeing here is we're able to bring a variety of different data types together um, in a comprehensive way and also in a three-dimensional way. So, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, this is that LIDAR uh, change detection map uh, that we were seeing earlier. And we actually have the CAD file of the uh, overpass that uh, was built or at the time of this model planning to be built. 
uh, overlaid and georeferenced uh, to that. But where it gets really interesting is I can actually um, move this around and I can actually go into the subsurface. Now, right now I'm showing you this in kind of a typical uh, three-dimensional mode, um, but what I can also do is I can actually uh, go into an aug what we call an augmented reality mode. And I'm actually gonna drop this model uh, into my space. So now you can see that I'm actually, what you're seeing is the view that I'm seeing through my device. Uh, again, right now I'm using my iPad, but it's actually dropped into my, uh, my space here. So I can actually interact with this as an actual uh, three-dimensional model in my space. If I was wearing a headset, this would actually be uh, even more immersive because it would actually be a true three-dimensional hologram that I could actually walk around or walk into. Uh, I'm showing you the, the augmented reality view of that now. And if I have other participants in this meeting, and I'll show you an example of how that works later, um, you, need, you can actually have multiple people joining this meeting either in the same space or in other virtual spaces from around the world, and you would actually see uh, their avatars uh, in this in this 3D space. So as I say, we've got the, the LiDAR map, we've got the CAD model uh, sitting on top of that. But again, where it gets interesting is where we go into the subsurface and we actually see some of the subsurface information. So uh, we can see here, there's the resistivity uh, that we were, Ben was referring to uh, earlier. Uh, we can see the actual anchors of the bridge uh, that overpass from above, uh, but we can also see additional uh, data information showing up here as well. And um, what we're seeing is some of the boreholes. So I have um, on, on the left-hand side of my software here, I have uh, all of my uh, observations that have been added to this model. And we see that we've got some lithology here. We have uh, geophysics. We've got some piezometer data. We've got some SAA data. I've gone ahead and opened up some of the lithology so these, of course, are boreholes that were actually taken on the site. Um, but what's important to note is not only do we have these 3D representations, these boreholes that are georeferenced to where they are actually drilled on the site, this is data-driven. This isn't just a pretty picture of boreholes. As you can see, as I actually tap my finger on the different um, parts of this, that we actually get the actual data from uh, that uh, from that section of the borehole. So we can see the elevation, we can see the eastings and northings, we can see the lithology and the sample depth. So this is all data-driven. These were actually borehole logs. And if, if you're familiar with borehole logs, I'm sure most of you are, that's just a big, you know, basically spreadsheet of data. Uh, and we can import that and uh, the software will actually automatically translate that into these, uh, these visual representations. So what's important about this is uh, engineers, uh, as, you, as you all well know, uh, are good at uh, creating a, a, a kind of a 3D model in their own mind uh, when they see a variety of different project data types. That's kind of where the training uh, comes in. Um, but what can be difficult is uh, getting everyone's individual 3D uh, mind map uh, to, to align. And so by bringing people into this three-dimensional immersive space, and actually uh, sharing that same 3D model in a holographic way, we can get to that place of common operational understanding uh, a lot quicker. Um, so what we have here is the ability to bring a variety of different people together, show them what's happening on a future project or a current project, show them the progress of that project, but also take them to places where it's very difficult to take them otherwise, in this case, um, we are looking at the, uh, the subsurface of, of this, uh, this area. Um, we, again, we can bring a variety of different data types together. So as an example, um, we can switch our base map. So this is our change detection base map. I can go to some LIDAR uh, that was taken in 2020, and that's overlaid on top of a, um, a map of the area. And I can also switch that with the 2021 LiDAR. So whatever you know, different data types that you've got to bring together in a project, we can actually show those all as different uh, layers. So I want to uh, quickly switch to another example here.
So we just refer to these as uh, as workspaces. So this is another project using uh, this technology in uh, Alaska, in Denali National Park. And um, the uh, what's happened there is another uh, landslide. You can see the alluvial flow kind of down at the bottom here. Um, I'll zoom in on that. And um, this cut off the uh, basically the only road that, that connects uh, the east and west side of uh, Denali National Park. So the plan here is to build a bridge. So again, we see that we've brought in uh, the CAD file of the bridge. Uh, we've brought the brown areas kind of on the left and right hand side. These are DEMs of the uh, hill cuts uh, that will be um, that will be happening as part of this construction process. And uh, we have uh, again the uh, the actual bridge itself, and we've got a cute little school bus there uh, driving over it. Uh, so, as before, I can actually go into the augmented reality view, and I'm going to drop it into my space. So, again, we see this as an actual true, true three-dimensional hologram <clears throat> of the mountainside, uh, actually, um, in my space. And, depend and, you know, my home office here is quite, quite small. Uh, but depending on how large a space you have, you can actually blow this up to a very large scale. And in terms of you know, human scale objects like this bridge, we can actually show this bridge. Excuse me. We can show this bridge in a one to one scale. So as an example, um, when we're you know, giving uh, demos to this to the project participants, we can actually uh, you know, get a, a large room um, and show this bridge in one-to-one -one scale and people wearing the headsets, they can actually walk the bridge and they can actually get a feel for the scale of that bridge, what that bridge is gonna look like. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, there's a lot of different stakeholders in a project like this. So we have the actual uh, geotechnical engineers, we've got the uh, construction engineers, we have environmental engineers, we have representatives of federal highways, federal parks, uh, as well as um, the park service itself. So we have, <clears throat> excuse me, we have all of these different stakeholders that are participating and need to have a, a say in this project. And uh, by bringing them all together in this virtual environment, and this was especially important uh, during uh, the COVID when this project was getting started, it was not possible to, to have all of these people travel up to Alaska and then travel to this remote site. It's difficult at the best of times. But use, by using this technology, we were able to set the, send the headsets out to eight or 10 different people around North America. They put the headset on, join the meeting, like a team or Zoom's meeting at set time, except now they're actually meeting in a 3D virtual space and they can actually see all of these different uh, uh, data types brought together and they can actually um, have a meeting in that metaverse space to discuss moving the project forward. Uh, I'm just going to actually show you here. We can actually even go into the underground. I'm going to kind of get my get a little close here and bring that model around. Um, zoom in on that. There we go. When we go into the underground, we'll actually see what's happening underground with this. Um, that there's uh, both the anchoring uh, that's going to be happening in, uh, in the rock face. But we also see these uh, boreholes that are kind of coming up to some equipment on the surface. And these are thermosiphons uh, that are being brought in to regulate the temperature of the ground where the anchoring is going to be happening to make sure that uh, that anchoring uh, stays in place. So we can not only visualize what's happening above ground, but we can also go into the, uh, into the subsurface as well. But where this gets really interesting is, yes, we're able to visualize um, uh, all of this project data that people can view and, and, and meet in a virtual meeting, but it actually becomes a living document because we're actually able to give the ability for people on site to actually take three-dimensional scans of the things that they see on site. So um, this is the particular device I have in my hand. This is an iPad Pro. Uh, similar with the iPhone Pro, you may or may not be familiar with this, but they actually have LiDAR scanners uh, built into them. Uh, and so the, the Apple uh, iPhone and iPad Pros can actually take 3D scans using the built-in LiDAR scanner. 
Um, the Cleario software that I'm demonstrating to you now uh, takes advantage of that and actually allows you to create these three-dimensional scans. And so what's happening is for this particular project, because it's in a national park, um, the blasting that they're doing, they, it needs to be, uh, when it's done, it needs to look like natural rock. It can't look like a blasted zone. So they're able to actually take scans before and after and do comparisons after the project to show the, uh, the various stakeholders uh, the results of, of the construction work. And so this 3D scan was literally taken by pressing a button, by moving the device in front of the area, and literally in, in a minute or two, uh, we have a three-dimensional scan of that area. And again, I can go into AR mode and actually float that in front of me, and I can go to one-to-one -one scale. And now it's as if I were standing at the site in Alaska, in Denali National Park, in front of this rock face. So if you have experts that are actually needing to weigh in uh, that aren't close to the field, they're you know, many days travel away, you can have the people on site actually use the software to take 3D scans, and then you can have a virtual meeting with the expert back at the office, and, is it, and the expert can actually weigh in as if they were actually standing on site uh, looking at the issue that has been, uh, um, that has been brought up. So this is another example of how we can use this uh, augmented reality technology to actually bring, instead of bringing the expert to the field, we can actually bring the field to the expert. Um, some other things that we can do here is I can actually bring up different scan and we can actually do some comparisons. Now these scans are totally different, so this doesn't really make sense, but later on after the project's been done and they rescan the same area after the blasting and, and excavation has been complete, they can compare side by side the before and after scans to kind of see what has changed uh, on that site. So here we're comparing the two scans side by side, or we can go into an AV mode where we can actually scrub uh, between them. So again, this gives us this ability to uh, move projects forward, make decisions uh, more quickly, avoid downtime uh, on the site, and avoid unnecessary travel. There's obviously still going to be travel. There's still going to be people moving back and forth from remote sites. But this actually can uh, reduce uh, some of that travel uh, necessity. So I was talking about the virtual meeting uh, capability. And what I want to do is um, switch screens here and just show you a quick uh, video. So what you're seeing here is an example of one of these virtual meeting sessions. And this is actually a LIDAR scan, uh, or sorry, a photogrammetry scan, my apologies, uh, of a project site. And we're actually seeing an example of uh, people, this is being projected as a three-dimensional hologram in the boardroom. And you see the people are wearing the headsets. They're actually, this is the view of what they're seeing. But you're also seeing the avatars of people that are joining this meeting from a remote location. This could be anywhere else in the world. And not only are we able to see uh, the avatars of where the other people are, but we can also see their hands and what they're pointing to. And of course, we can also have uh, a conversation so they can actually hear each other. It's actually spatial audio. So if someone's on your left, you hear them on the left, et cetera. So they're actually having a productive project meeting around this 3D data, uh, even though not all of the, the participants are in the same room. And in fact, the way that I actually have <clears throat> um, recorded this video is I'm also a participant in this meeting. My iPad has joined as a member of this virtual meeting, and I'm literally have just done a screen recording. So by well, so what you're seeing is an actual, um, you know, at the time live meeting that was just being re screen recorded on my iPad of this virtual meeting. So this this holographic uh, visualization is actually projected into the space, and we have the local participants that are wearing the headsets, and they see this 3D data in front of them as, as if it were an actual object. And then the people that are participating from a remote location show up 
uh, as the avatars. So we find that we're able to do a lot of uh, this project uh, meeting work where we can get people to have a clear understanding of what's happening, uh, have a clear uh, common operational understanding of what's happening much quicker than before. And we're able to actually uh, bring people together where it's either difficult or uh, cost prohibitive or in some cases impossible uh, to do. So I know we have uh, a number of questions. Uh, so maybe I'm gonna uh, leave some time uh, to answer that. John, do you wanna lead us off on, on some of our questions? I, I do. I, I, first thing I wanna just point out to everybody who's watching, the sort of shuttering of the videos that we see on Zoom is a Zoom problem, not a problem of this technology. It's pretty fascinating technology. The unfortunate part for us when we're seeing these scans kind of uh, clued you around a little bit is is uh, is because we're using the, the you know the Zoom webinar software, so maybe that's the next thing that really needs to be improved. Um, and then a, just a clarification, Keith, on this model, I just think you should point out what the scale is because you know this is a pipe, and if you look at this photogrammetry, you might think, oh, that's just a that's just a small pipe. Um, but then you realize that there's probably some stairs down there in the corner and yeah. some people for scale. Um, so you just it, 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 it'll change your perspective to understand that this is actually quite a large site. It is, and yeah, so you can actually see there's some stairs there, and uh, the, there's some uh, high vis uh, jackets at the bottom of the stairs, and then there's you know kind of a large uh, uh, hut. So you know I would say maybe that 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 hut would be you know six, seven, eight feet tall um, for someone to stand under. Uh, so that kind of gives you a scale. So what we're able to do, because obviously we're in a boardroom, we're doing what's called a tabletop mode. And um, in tabletop mode, we basically just shrink things down to kind of a, what we call a one meter sandbox. So everything's kind of sitting in a one by one meter. But we can go to one to one scale on this. So we could literally, if we had if we had space big enough, we could actually go to one to one scale and we could actually um, have is this is be as if you were standing on this site, looking at this pipe, looking at this excavation, or we can put you in the bottom of the excavation uh, in one-to-one -one scale. So I think a lot of the questions that that, um, that I see have come in and um, have really focused around the application and the uh, how much do these devices cost? How expensive are they? What's the entry point for the hardware? What's the entry point for the software? Can these kinds of uh, software and hardware devices uh, be acquired by a small G professional firm? Yeah, so um, cost ranges, uh, you know, in terms of uh, what I was showing you today, like using like an iPad or an iPhone to you know participate in this, that that cost may be zero because you may have uh, access to that technology already. Otherwise, it's just you know making that purchase uh, you know through the Apple Store. Uh, some of the VR headsets, like the um, uh, the Meta Quest Two, uh, is um, you know about three hundred dollars. So that's a relatively inexpensive entry point to getting into that sort of three D virtualization. Um, the Hololens is a little bit more expensive if you want to have that that true uh, Hololens experience. Um, this is more like about $3,500. So the cost range was from you know, $3,500 at the, at the high end to down to a few hundred dollars down to possibly $0. Uh, the software we've been looking at is called Clirio, um, C-L-I-R-I-O. And um, that's something that uh, you, know, you, can, you can check out. Um, uh, the, the cost of that, uh, you know, I don't want to get into you know, too much of a sales pitch, uh, being more informational here, but uh, the cost on that can range from $0 to, you know, to kind of try it. You know, there's a trial version of that um, up to, you know, uh, I think $49 a month for using it uh, uh, in the field. So it's, it's relatively inexpensive to get involved in this. You can literally cobble together some, some uh, hardware that you have on site, or you might have own personally and a free trial of the software and you can get started on this with, with no money invested. And then you can kind of decide whether you want to start spending money on licensing software and buying higher end uh, equipment. So the, so the software you used for today's examples included um, obviously the clear software. Was there other software that was required to, to pull together your demonstrations? 
Well, I mean, we're talking about a lot of data visualization here, right? So uh, obviously there's a workflow that leads up to the visualization that you would all, they're already be in house. So in terms of like your geomatics, your GIS team, you know, they would be working with software like Global Mapper or Esri. Uh, they would be working with subsurface data, uh, maybe from whole base or digs. Um, they would be uh, working with photogrammetry software um, you know, it's like PIX4D. Uh, so you, you'd have all of this existing workflow uh, that you would be already doing within your organization. Um, the interesting thing is, um, or the ironic thing is, is that despite the fact that engineers and geomatics and GIS folks have been working with 3D data for years, uh, they view it in, in, in an inherently 2D way by looking at it on their laptop and computer screens. So what we're talking about is taking the data off the 2D screen and putting it into the room as an actual true three-dimensional hologram so you can interact with it in a true three-dimensional way. And, and is there specific training too that can be, you know, can, are there uh, online courses, other kinds of courses? One of the questions we got is how do you get to train to use the software? You know, Ben, maybe I'll ask, I'll let you answer that just in terms of your learning curve, you know. Yes. Yeah, so you know, uh, the, the the first time that we uh, developed models using the Hololens was for the A game, and we developed a very simple model to show non technical people what we were talking about with the A game, what the the value was, and um, so uh, uh, Scott Anderson and uh, a few others from BGC. Um, uh, develop the models and uh, we, we purchased the hollow lenses uh, uh, through BGC. And, um, you know, as far as the learning curve, we had uh, the, um, the first uh, generation of, of the hollow lens and the interaction or the, the, in, uh, the new models, I think, the, and the way you've set them up are, are very intuitive. But it actually didn't take long to understand the so a hollow lens is a Microsoft products and there were air taps and other blooms and, and other things that you had to to, to learn. Um, I don't think it's quite as as uh, uh, onerous, uh, but quite honestly, it wasn't that bad. Um, you know, in, in a day's time, you could you could get uh, proficient enough to to navigate. Um, so yeah, it it. I think you learn more and more and, and actually just uh, sort of go back to the picture that you have right here on the screen and, and the superpower that we, we have on, you know, at this scale, you're, you're sort of seeing as, as a bird eye view. And I think that's another thing that, that when you're learning uh, the, the models uh, and they are scalable, you know, within space, you you uh, you start to get better insights, and and you just sort of play around with it. But it doesn't take that long to to uh, to learn the basics. So here's another question: Is can you can you actually measure or draw on these images? So can you use the images to to make specific uh, measurements that you would normally be able to make in the field? Uh, yes and no. Uh, you know. Nothing's going to replace, uh, you know, a, an expert in the field with, uh, you know, standing on the rock with their uh, with their measurement tools, but we can uh, replace some of that virtually. Uh, so when you're um, uh, using uh, the hall lens as an example, the hall lens recognizes your hands, so your hands are actually your tools, uh, and so uh, within the, the Cleario software, uh, you can actually uh, reach out and drop pins, just like you're on a Google map. So imagine you're on a Google map and you drop a pin between two locations and Google will tell you the distance. Uh, we have a similar thing where you can drop pins on, say, uh, the bottom and top of a boulder or a, or a, a slag pile or, or, or what have you, and it will actually show you the distance uh, between those two pins so you can actually do measurements in the 3D virtual space. Uh, in terms of accuracy, the uh, uh, the the uh, listed accuracy on the um, on the iPhone and iPad Pro um, uh, scanner tool is is approximately one centimeter. So you know it's reasonable. It's not survey grade, but 
but it's definitely reasonable to get an idea of, of you know, the sizes and volumes of things that you're dealing with. And, and is it possible to use this actually within the terrain when you're there? So is it possible to, to see virtual and augmented reality superimposed within the real terrain? Have you tried that? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a tricky nut to crack actually. Um, with VR, of course, that doesn't work because you can't see the terrain um, and you're gonna trip over a rock. So you don't wanna do that. Um, with the, uh, with the uh, headset that, like this one you, where you can see out, it is sensitive to light. So in bright sunny conditions, maybe you're not gonna get a very clear uh, image. So there's some challenges there. Uh, also, um, uh, you know, on site, you may have PPE requirements. Uh, Trimble, I'm sure a company you're, everyone's familiar with, they actually make a version of the HoloLens where they actually embed it in a, uh, uh, a, com a compliant hard hat. So you can actually have a hard hat version of this uh, in the field. They also make a polarized uh, kind of um, film that goes over it that helps with that. So, uh, you know, definitely that possibility exists, but there are a few uh, technical challenges to overcome. Yeah. So, it, you know, I have you know, seen other applications, not, not necessarily with the models that, that we've seen here, but, um, you know, if, 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 you know, with a tablet and looking uh, for, you know, uh, applications for like, you know, uh, restocking shelves and, you know, I've seen applications where they, they have that data available that was, uh, you know, recorded yesterday and they see what's there today. And the same thing, uh, that that has been done um, remotely, and I've, I've seen that with uh, you know the models that, that we have created here or takeoffs on on volumes. But I could see that application not necessarily with the model types that we're generating here, but um, very similar to the Army training and how they they've used it in the field. I, I think we could see what what quantities of earthwork were done yesterday, today, or whatever. Um, you know, sort of uh, overlapped on on uh, the landscape. It's I think it's quite possible. Yeah, so that kind of feeds this question of can monitor data be incorporated in the AR models as ongoing deliverables, for example, complete completion of a performance assessment with continuous ongoing data feeds. So could you think of an of an application where? Uh, I didn't quite hear that entire question. Okay, so the question was, can monitor data be incorporated to the error models as an ongoing deliverable following completion of performance assessment? So with examples for continuous yeah. ongoing data feeds. Yeah, for like INSAR and, and LIDAR data. Yeah, uh, in fact, that um, uh, Alabama project had um, uh, LIDAR data that they, they uh, flew uh, and, and they, there's a time scrubber there that you can see the, um, you know, over, over time, the changes, change detection. And the same thing could, you know, for, for the data sources, um, you know, there, there are multiple data sources that could be included. You know, it's all digital, all the A-game technologies that, that we've been promoting, uh, you know, recently are all digitally acquired. So, um, you know, that, that part of it is, uh, quite quite doable so for performance uh and like you saw that digital twin on alabama i, th I think those types of applications or you know monitoring the slope um you know there are are quite feasible so and it, just a uh, note on that so it's not going to be real tend not to be real time but what we would refer to as near real time right so that there might be some period delay in minutes or, or hours between that, that that data from the field. But yeah, we're seeing some really interesting things coming up in terms of, um, you know, taking stream monitoring, taking seismic uh, data, taking uh, uh, slope uh, slope data, uh, f uh, and using, you know, IoT and Internet of Things approach using various APIs to actually connect so that you start with that base model that we were showing earlier. Uh, but then you'd have a point on that model, which would actually, you know, show you what that's what the stream level was within the last hour or something like that. Have, have you guys ever come across cases where this has been applied to mining or tunneling? Yeah, so, um, 
we use this quite a bit uh, uh, in mining. Um, the you know again we have the ability to take those uh, those scans. The great thing about the lidar scans is they don't need light or don't need a lot of light to take rock face scans. Uh, and again, you can kind of bring that uh, uh, that that ex feel to the expert by taking a three D scan of a rock face. Um, back at the uh, the office, you could have the consulting engineer view that in one to one scale as if they were standing there, and then they can you know make uh, suggestions on on how to move forward. You know, maybe more shot creep, more anchor bolts, something like that. Um, so yeah, we're definitely seeing this being used in mining. So I just, I'm going to do two more questions, um, a big one at the end for you. And so just a quick question, I think for Keith, have you worked with developers using uh, versions of Apple Vision Pro, or do you have plans to use an alternative to the HoloLens? Yeah, so the, you know, the HoloLens has uh, kind of been the, the state of the art. Um, obviously, Apple has got uh, some different ideas coming up in the new year, and we're very excited about uh the Apple Vision Pro, we kind of think it will be the iPhone moment for AR and VR. You know, it will basically uh, take this from something that some people do to something that everyone does. Like, we'll soon wonder how we live without without it, just like we do with our phones today. So, uh, you know, we, we are actually uh, going down to Cupertino uh, uh, in the next uh, month or so to actually test our software on the Apple Vision Pro. Uh, so we're really excited uh, about that. Um, you know, if you, I'm an I'm an Apple guy from way back, uh, but obviously, you know, work with uh, you know Microsoft stuff. But it really, um, it, it really shows the difference between the two uh, companies. You know, Apple's like, okay, we're gonna have put cameras pointed at your eyes, and then we're gonna have this high res screen that'll project your eyes so people can see your eyes. And then Microsoft goes, uh, just make it clear, just make it clear, plus. <laughs> Okay, so last question I'm going to ask each of you. I'll, I'll, I'll start with Ben and then end with Keith. So the question here is, what's the most exciting technology you see coming down the road that geoprofessionals should look for? You know, oh, it's the, the, the Ben sorry. first and then Keith. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, so you know, I I think we're we're at a point, um, especially at, with digital information, data, geotechnical data, uh, digs, I think, is going to be revolutionary here and or have a revolutionary uh, place with being able to transfer data among these applications, you know, from from the time that we acquire the data to to processing um, and doing uh, analysis to getting them in the models and, and looking at data, seeing if our site model makes sense. Uh, you know, throughout that workflow, I think that is going to be uh, a revolutionary point, uh, you know, as, as we sort of go forward. Yeah, Keith. Yeah, uh, I think the exciting thing for me is the democratization of this uh, technology. Uh, the fact that anyone in the field can have a 3D LiDAR scanner in their pocket that's easy to use, it's low cost, and that's just going to basically open up the floodgates on, on the use uh, of this technology. It's just the fact that you don't need a specialized, trained person with specialized equipment to go out to site to create this, this 3D data. That anyone from the uh, field engineer down to the bulldozer driver is going to have the ability to capture uh, issues that they see on site in one-to-one -one scale three dimension and have experts that are hundreds or thousands of miles away uh, weigh in and solve those problems. That democratization is really the exciting part for me. Oh, cool. Well, I, I, um, I want to thank everybody for participating. We had a lot more questions that we didn't get to. I apologize that, but we're, we're clearly out of time. So um, I hope that you'll, uh, if you if you want to see some of this again, visit the YouTube version of the of the of the webinar. Um, It'll be posted soon, and you should get a reminder of that uh, after this concludes from the National Academy in an email. Um, I have to finish with the disclaimer to just say that any opinions, conclusions, or recommendations expressed by the panelists or anyone during this webinar are those of the individuals and do not represent uh, conclusions or recommendations of the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. 
And so with that, I'll close this webinar and thank our speakers and thank everybody who participated. It was a good one. Thank you. Thanks thank you. Everyone. Take care.